www.ufa.org. During the webcast, I will be joined by Farah Eck, UNA USA Senior Director, who will help moderate the program. Furthermore, throughout the program, please feel free to type questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen on the right. Questions will be monitored by Farah, who will share as many as possible during the Q&A session. Today's session is titled UN75 and You with guest speaker Fabrizio Hoschild, Special Advisor on the preparations for the commemora commemoration of the United Nations 75th anniversary, United Nations Secretary at New York. It is an honor to have Mr. Hoschild on the webcast because UNA USA made the commitment to have Americans from every state represented in the biggest ever global conversation on the role of global cooperation in building the future we want. Like other organizational partners, UNA USA will be submitting a comprehensive report by the end of June to be included with the global findings. You will learn more about participating in UNA's consultations at the end of this program. Now to introduce today's speaker. In his current role, Mr. Hoschild is heading the Secretary General's vision for the Global Citizen Conversation on the UN 75th anniversary this year. Prior to his appointment, Mr. Hoschild served as Assistant Secretary General for Strategic Coordination in the Executive Office of the Secretary General from 2017 to 2019. Previously, he served as Deputy Special Representative for the UN Peacekeeping Mission in Central African Republic in 2016. UN Resident Coordinator, Humanitarian Coordinator, and Resident Representative of the UN Development Program in Columbia from 2013 to 2016, and as Director of the Field Personnel Division for the United Nations from 2010 to 2012. He started his career in 1988 with UNHCR and served in various field settings. A graduate of the University of Oxford, United Kingdom, he has published studies and articles on leadership, on the protection of civilians, on transitional justice and reconciliation, among other topics. Mr. Hoschild, thank you so much for joining us today. So if you can um, talk to us about your work and the purpose behind the UN Secretary General's call for these global conversations during this UN 75th anniversary. Thank you so much, uh, Rachel, and thank you for making this possible. Uh, I'd like to, first of all, express the wish that all those who are on this call are, are safe and well uh, with their families as we face this, this terrible pandemic. 2020 is, of course, the 75th anniversary uh, of the UN, but I'd like to begin by asking what might appear to be a very silly question what will 2020 be remembered for? And of course, what immediately comes to mind is this uh, pandemic, which has no like, um, not only in the lifetime of the United Nations, but beyond that, in over a hundred years, the world has never faced uh, a, a threat like this. But when I ask that question, what I really mean is, what is the world gonna look like afterwards? Will this forced moment for so many of reflection, of confinement, of meditation, help us all and help the world come to its senses? And will we come out of this with greater solidarity and with a greater will to work together across sectors, across generations, across borders and continents for the greater welfare in a form of enlightened self-interest in an interconnected planet? Or will we come out with greater isolationism, more mistrust, more inward looking? And I think that's still a very open question, but it's one that the UN 75 initiative wants to create a platform to try and help people participate in pushing the world to answer in one way or another and make people's contribution count and not let that discussion be left solely in the hands of political interests that often in their very nature uh, are more focused more on national interests and short-term time horizons. So the big question is, where will the world head after this? Will we progress or regress? I think we can say that for the past 75 years, since the birth of the um, United Nations, 
obviously, with many exceptions in many at many different times in many different parts of the world, but the world has basically moved forward. Poverty rates uh, have gone from about 50 percent, half the world in poverty when the UN came into being to about 10 percent uh, today. Our health has got better, notwithstanding what we're living now. The average age people live to when the UN came to, into being was around 50 years of age. It's now closer to 80. Uh, we're much better educated. Literacy rates globally were around 50% when the UN came into being, and we're now at about 90%. But will those positive trends continue? I don't think that's so clear. Climate change poses an unprecedented threat with a two degrees rise, and we're well on track to have that two degrees rise now, um, city, the oceans will rise by over a foot. That will put cities in ocean areas in threat, and the people, about a billion people living in those cities, will be compelled to flee. New technology, and we're benefiting it from now, if COVID, at least the world that's connected, brings massive advantages, but I think it's still an open question whether it leaves us more secure or less secure, whether our privacy will be better guarded or less guarded, whether it will lead globally to more or less equality. And then um, if we look at other forms of inequality, income inequality, the world has progressed and is still progressing in eradicating poverty, but inequality is quite a different matter. Um, in, in, in the past 20 years since the financial crisis, the number of billionaires in the world has gone up threefold. Uh, at the same time, the incomes of those who earn the, in the bottom 20% of income categories have barely seen a change in their income. In two out of three countries in the world, income inequality has gone up. And of course, inequality fuels conflict, it fuels violence, it fuels um, polarization and many other societal ills. So how are we going to cope with this and other trends, the pandemic, population growth, aging populations in some parts, uh, youth populations in others, protracted conflict in many parts of the world, increased superpower rivalry, the breakdown of international um, weapons control regimes, new domains of conflict, cyber. Um, none of these problems, none of these challenges, which will really determine our future, will really determine whether we see the, the same progress we've benefited from, thanks to the foresight of previous generations, not too much thanks to our own efforts, whether we will be able to guarantee for that for the generation still to come. What will determine that in a large part is international cooperation. None of the, 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 the challenges I've mentioned, be it new technologies, be it, um, be it climate change, be it demographic change, be it protracted conflict in many parts of the world, None of those things are, are things that any single country, however big, however powerful, however rich, can deal with on their own. We need international cooperation. And as the world grows ever more interconnected, it is, it is essential to defend national and community interests to have strengthened international cooperation. And it was against that background that the Secretary General started this initiative. It was against that background, combined with a retreat from international cooperation. So a fundamental co co contradiction between the increased need because of these global mega trends, but a decline in the willingness for international cooperation that the Secretary General went, launched this initiative with a view to bringing we the peoples the, the first three words of the charter, the peoples that the UN is ultimately accountable for into the debate and saying, let's get this debate outside our blue bubble, outside member state representatives, and let's hear from we the peoples, what do they see as the global priorities? What do they expect of a modernized, we're not looking for a pat on the back, we want critical contributions 
to how we could do better. And our sense, this was conceived of before the pandemic, but our sense is that the pandemic has made this, um, this, this discussion more urgent and more necessary. Um, there's absolutely no question uh, that lives will be saved and lives will be lost on the strength of international cooperation in dealing with this pandemic. And what we're seeing in a sudden onset disaster in the pandemic is happening in a slower form, but in a no less grave form in developments like climate change. We cannot manage climate change. No country can manage it on its own. No region can manage it on its own. It needs international cooperation. And the absence of global cooperation and dealing with it will be just as deadly, and some suggest more so, than an absence of de global cooperation dealing with the pandemic. So these are very big questions. This is of critical importance to our own lives, but even more so to the lives of our kids and our grandkids or generations that come after us. Um, and I think we, we cannot leave it just to, the, to, to fate to unfold. The, the future is not determined. Whether we come out of this more united or less united depends on all of us. And the whole point of UN 75 is to provide a platform for people across the world everywhere to weigh in. Um, of course, we've had to make adaptions. We did envisaged having a lot of in-person discussions, and, and that's no longer possible. But we're going digital where, wherever we can. We're working with as many different digital platforms as we can to extend our reach digitally. There is the very easy way, this one minute survey that anybody with access um, to the net can contribute. Uh, we've already got um, close to 70,000 responses from 187 countries, but we'd like to scale that up. We want to make this as inclusive a process um, as possible. We want to hear from everybody. We want to hear from our critics. We want to hear from people who don't traditionally uh, uh, have much to do with the UN. Um, and, and we want to bring those voices to heads of state to try uh, and, and influence the debate, to try and make international cooperation function better and function in a way that is more in sync with people's aspirations for their future, with people's fears for their future, and with their specific expectations on how we can function better. So that's uh, the aim, and we'd really appreciate not only the support from, uh, from UN uh, Association of the US, but everybody who's listening in, please help us reach out and get more voices into this conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, I, you know, we are at a, a definite pivotal moment, um, and it's so important for people to get engaged, and I'm glad you talked about how they could fill out these one minute um, um, surveys that you have on the UN75 website, or they can participate in our consultations, which we'll talk a little bit about further. Um, but just a couple of questions to you, you know, from these dialogues, the outcomes are meant to be compiled and serve as a roadmap for moving forward. Can you speak a little bit more about how these findings may inspire new programs uh, investments or partnerships or even campaigns? Yes, we will. I mean, we will come out of this with a fairly clear view of what the world sees, at least those who participate in our initiatives. And we're collecting data through many, many streams. We're also going to do the Pew Foundation is going to do more formal, more scientific surveys for us. Um, we're, we're in a partnership. Um, with uh, a, a big company called Edelman that some of you might have heard about um, to do AI analysis of social media and media. Um, we're, we're looking at what's coming out of think tanks and universities across the world about the UN. So we're collecting all these data streams about what the world feels are its priorities, what are its biggest fears of where we're headed, and, and how we can better address the gap between our aspirations and where we're headed if we leave current megatrends not attended to. And we want to use that to advocate with leaders everywhere, starting with leaders who should come together on the 21st of September in New York 
to, to mark the 75th anniversary of the, of the United Nations. We want to use that to try and influence them to work better together to address these concerns of people. And that can happen at a global level here, but it can also happen at a domestic level, at a community level. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we all, you know, one of the, the banners we're functioning under is be the change. I mean, um, I, and I think, you know, new forms of leadership are also emerging from this crisis. We see that. I, do, I think that the times are past when we just look to world leaders and sit back and wait for them to do things. There will be that element. World leaders need to be held accountable. But I think this will also give pointers to what we should be doing more in our own communities to try and advance these agendas, whether it's um, uh, uh, new behavior to try and minimize our personal contributions to climate change, whether it's addressing inequalities within our community. I think there are possibilities at every level uh, to turn the findings that we'll come up with into action at a personal, at a communal, at a national, at a regional, and at a global level. And we will um, try and create the tools uh, to facilitate that. Great. And, and then also, you know, there's so much going on this year. I know, obviously, the um, pandemic, but beyond that, it's the start of the decade of action and delivery for the SDGs. There are major conferences on climate change, biodiversity, um, non, uh, nuclear non-proliferation and health. Um, you've got the 25th anniversary of the Beijing World Conference on Women. You've got the 20th anniversary of the UN Security uh, Council's resolution on uh, 1325. It's the 10th anniversary of UN Women. I mean, I can go on and on. So how do you hope that the UN 75 campaign uh, stands out on, on its own from these initiatives, but also how do you anticipate that the campaign um, will support and complement these initiatives? Well, it's all interconnected and mutually supportive. Um, I mean, the, 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 our, our initiative, it's, less a campaign than a global listening tour is about global megatrends. And we, we focus um, on four or five, but one of them is loss of biodiversity and climate change. Um, so it's very much linked to, to concerns and the, and the, the, the initiatives related to, to oceans. Uh, we also um, have a strong gender component. So it's very much linked also to the, to the 10th um, anniversary of UN Women and the, the 25th anniversary of, of, of Beijing. Um, and the, the SDGs are cross-cutting in all. Um, but you know, to fulfill the SDGs, national action is key, regional action is key, but international solidarity is also key. And I think that is at the heart of our initiative. It's um, about reinforcing international solidarity, international cooperation, but not as an end in itself, not as a methodology or as sometimes one hears in this country as some form of ideology. No, it's a, it's a method precisely to deliver better on gender equality, to deliver better on the SDGs, to deliver better on sustaining biodiversity, to deliver better on containing climate change. So all these, it's about the environment in which all this unfolds. So I think it's very interlinked. We don't see ourselves as in competition. And, you know, in all our initiatives, we, we give a shout out for the Decade of Action. We give a shout out for Beijing. And if you look at our materials online, you'll see lots of cross references. Yeah. So I think the exciting thing about um, the, the UN 75th uh, global consultations is it's really about having conversations. So we actually wanna switch gears and ask our audience some questions and get them to participate in kind of a mini um, uh, conversation for UN 75. So we're gonna start some polling questions that our audience can participate in. And so the first question we're gonna ask everyone um, to participate in on this poll is overall, do you think that people in 2045 will be better off, worse off, 
or the same as today? And I'll give you 30 seconds to answer this poll. And I don't see the timer, but um, once the poll is closed, we'll move forward. Okay, so um, what are your thoughts on, on these responses? It looks like 50% say we're gonna be better off. Is this kind of like what you're seeing from other um, surveys that you've received? Well, in fact, um, you know, we're releasing an interim report on our findings mm -hmm. uh, in the next two days. And what, what you've just shown um, is, is very similar to what we've seen in the, in the, in the 50,000 responses that we got by the time we uh, did this report in the first three months um, of, this, of this year. Um, it was interesting. What we found is that there was greater optimism among younger people. And looking at it globally, uh, there was greater optimism. And I guess this won't come too much as a surprise, but there was greater optimism in Asia than on other continents. Um, but otherwise, the, 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 the spread was very uh, even between uh, those who thought the future would be better and those who thought the future would be less good. But with a clear um a clear bias uh, towards optimism among younger people which personally came to me as a bit of a surprise but but is tremendously encouraging great let's move on to the next one number two if for everyone in the audience if you picture the world you want in 25 years what three things would you want to see and i'll give you 40 seconds to respond and you can select three items. I'm so interested to see what's going to come up. And then once again, once we get to 40 seconds, we'll close it off so we can take a look at it. Okay. So uh, Fabricio, uh, hopefully you can see the uh, responses here. I'm curious what your thoughts are on this. I'm I'm quite struck because I, I mentioned that the further the, the the previous answer was very similar to what we got from our global poll, but here one sees quite a difference. In our global poll, environmental protection came out three times higher than anything else, whereas um, here it's um, here it's more or less or similar to to, to human rights less conflict and healthcare. Um, I mean, armed, it's the, 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 the top ones are similar. It was also human rights and less conflict in, our, in ours were, were also at the top. Um, healthcare understandably went up um, after the COVID um, outbreak. Um, but so, so the, 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 it's the same first three or four we have, but with the difference that more environmental protection was a major, major uh, way ahead of the other three. Right. Okay, let's move on to the third one. Which of these global trends do you think will most affect our future? And you can choose up to three and you'll have 30 seconds to respond. <clears throat> okay, I think we're almost there. OK, 
Okay, let's see these results. So your reaction to this one, this is definitely an overwhelming response for uh, climate change and environmental issues. Yeah, well, again, this is, I mean, climate change and environmental issues were at the top in our global, um, in the interim report of our global, um, you know, this puts health risks at second place. Mm -hmm. And perhaps because our findings were done earlier, you know, in the first three months of this year, when um, health risk was in third place, not in second, but I'm, but I suspect now it would also be in, in second place. Um, but what's striking is, is new tech with us was in, in fourth place um, and in second place was, um, was conflict, um, armed conflict, which is quite far down. Mm -hmm. But I guess also, um, I guess also that, you know, represents US audience, you know, many of the people that would have responded to, to our global, in the global exercise, would have been in or near areas in conflict. So it's not surprising that it was higher up um, on the list. But I must say, I mean, what, what this, all this illustrates for me is, um, you know, I've, I, before, while we could still travel, I, I went to many different countries on different continents talking about this initiative. And I spoke in many universities with many um, students from remote places in Kazakhstan to remote places in Chile. And when you, you hear remarkably the same things. So if you're in New York and you talk to the diplomats and you ask them their priorities for the next year, you'll hear very different things, you know, mutually incompatible things. But you go and talk to people about their priorities for the future uh, across the world and, and the, the, the outcome is very, very similar. And I think this is illustrating it again. I mean, there are a little bit, there are differences which I've highlighted, but it's very similar to what we're hearing globally. Right. Well, let's go on to the fourth one. We have two more. Um, so the number uh, four poll question is, uh, keeping your top three global trends in mind, how important or not is it for countries to work together to manage their trends? And I'll just give you 15 seconds to answer. Okay. We may have lost that polling question, um, but I'm, I'm sure that uh, most people said that countries need to, to work together to manage these trends. So, and then the last one, um, we wanna give everyone an opportunity to write in. So in the Q&A box, if you can respond to this question, what would you advise the UN Secretary General to do to address these global trends? And um, while you're answering that, just note that um, I'm sure we're gonna get a lot of responses on this. So Mr. Hashal, we will send you these responses that our audience um, had answered on this question. And then we'll actually share it with the audience too in a follow-up email. Um, but I think this, this is the information that you want to gather. Um, so i like to move into q and I know we've had some questions in the Q&A box. Um, so Farah, can you walk us through some of the questions that came in for Mr. Hoshel in the uh, Q&A box? Absolutely, and thank you. Uh, a question came in from Oliveira Jankowski. Uh, given that you worked in post-conflict areas, could you please compare and contrast international cooperation when a region or country is in crisis versus a situation when the whole world is in crisis, like how we are under COVID now? Oof. Um, that's, that's a difficult question. I, you know, I, I've worked in a lot of emergencies, um, and especially in the emergency moment, 
among international actors, when the emergency is at, at its most acute, people were pretty well together. They do come together. Um, the, I, I won't pretend it's all plain sailing and easy, but when lives are at risk uh, and people are dying, a bit, you know, be it b b because of, uh, uh, of, um, of, you know, a cholera outbreak, as was the case in, in DRC after the genocide uh, uh, among the refugees who fled there, be it the result of shelling, as was the case in Sarajevo, um, be it the result of what was happening in, in, in Haiti um, after the earthquake, international actors on the ground tend to work fairly pragmatically and fairly well together. When things slow down, then the competition and, 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 the, and the frictions and the problems come in. But at the acute emergency stage, there tends to be a lot of cooperation and solidarity and common sense. Um, I'm not sure we're seeing much of that at a global scale. I think we're seeing some of that nationally I think we're seeing some of that within communities, but an international scale, I, I think there's still a deficit of that. I think there's still a lot of finger pointing and friction and, and politicization um, and uh, not enough uh, cooperation. Um, and we, we see that around some of the rhetoric. We see that around some of the squabbles uh, over, over distribution of medical equipment. Um, so, so I, perhaps because the world is less accustomed than the sort of people who are deployed to emergencies, um, but, but it's, I wish we would see more of the sort of pragmatism and ca camaraderie um, and solidarity between actors that you tend to see at least at the height of the emergency uh, in, 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 in the field situation. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Dan Becker. Do you feel that there is an urgent need for the world to rededicate and reacquaint itself with the UN Charter? Can this UN anniversary rededicate and reaffirm its values? I, I think there's an urgent need because global solidarity has to be based on a shared vision. You know, divisions, divisions are not going to disappear, and, and divisions arguably are not a bad thing. I mean, um, you know, di diversity of opinion is, is rich, enriches our societies, enriches uh, the world. So the aim of global cooperation isn't to put everybody, uh, uh, make everybody think alike. But having said that, um, for people to work effectively together, there has to be a shared vision. And I think against the backdrop of the Second World War, where there'd been untold of suffering, where tens of millions have been killed, where hundreds of millions have been displaced, where, where most of the globe had suffered terrible financial uh, loss, um, against that backdrop, there were differences. There were East and West were, were, were emerging divisions. North and South had divisions, divisions within countries. So it, it wasn't a moment of universal thinking the same or harmony, but there were, was a common aspiration um, for peace, a common for peace, not through arms, but peace through international agreement. There was a common aspiration for social justice there was a common aspiration for the realization of human rights. And those common aspirations allowed for cooperation beyond differences, allowed for people to work together despite those differences. And I think we've lost touch with those common aspirations. And all you have left with are our differences. And that's very dangerous. We're not gonna get rid of the differences. And arguably, they're not necessarily always a bad thing. But we, if we are to work together and deal with threats that are truly global, we need to reconnect with um, our, our commonalities and our common aspirations. And I think as they are expressed and formulated in the charter, they're still eminently um, relevant. So I think, and, and, and trying to sort of reconnect with, rebirth, rediscover our commonalities, the common spirit, which is linked to the charter, is part of our UN 75 objectives. Thank you. 
This is a combined question from Stephen Brandt and Alan Ware. If you can speak to leveraging the UN's call for global ceasefire, how can the ceasefire continue at, even after we emerge from the pandemic? I mean, we would hope very much that the ceasefire um, will, will lay the ground for something more durable. We hope very much that where ceasefire has been achieved, and there are indications, for example, in Yemen, um, in, in Sudan, um, in uh, Philippines, and in Colombia, to name a few countries, that combatants are taking it very seriously and are implementing it, that the people realize, and forgive me for stating the obvious, but that life with a ceasefire is much better. Um, and that um, there are alternative ways for settling disputes, um, notably through dialogue, um, apart from arms. And hopefully this enforced pause um, will uh, give greater room and greater scope to pursue the settlement of differences through dialogue as opposed to through arms. Uh, and, and that this ceasefire will help combatants come to their senses in that regard and give the mediators, um, whoever they are, greater room to advance um, during this period in resolving uh, the, 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 the differences through mediation as opposed to people trying to uh, advance their interests through, through guns. Thank you. This question is from Rosalind Helfund. What are your thoughts on the UN's role in working with governments to build both immediate and long-term environmental protections into economic recovery plans for after the pandemic? Well, the Secretary General has, has spoken a lot about this, that you know, the, the, the need should be on building back better, not just um, as, as economies restart, um, as, as we reinvest in industry, um, as, as the wheels of, of, of economy start, start turning again, we don't just go back to business as normal. We really take this enforced uh, pause to try and reorient um, and, and have um, uh, um, approaches that are much more environmentally um, savvy uh, uh, and um, contain our, our impact on, on climate change. Uh, and again, I mean, we, you know, we hope there are all these stories uh, you read about, about how air pollution in so many parts of the world has gone radically down, um, that people simply won't have a taste for going back to what was before, that having enjoyed for once what it's like to breathe um, uh, um, uh, clean air, um, there will be a much lower tolerance um, rate for, for or much, uh, much less willingness to, to go back to breathing um, air that is, that is dangerous. Um, so we, we really hope that um, po policy leaders um, and politicians uh, will, will take advantage of this. And we'll do, the UN is positioning itself um, to try and be helpful in that regard. But of course, ultimately, those are decisions that will be made by, by national leaders. Um, and, and the fear is that, you know, in, um, in, in a rush to get economies started again, um, there may be a trend to see anything environmental uh, as an expensive luxury. Um, so I, I, you know, I think it will be important that, that voices also speak up, that people speak up. Um, and, and say, no, we don't just want to go back. Of course, we want business to start again. Of course, we want economies to start. But let's take advantage of this to do things better, to do things differently. And that's very much um, the plea of the Secretary General. Thank you. Elizabeth Eames asks, will you disaggregate the results of your survey before and after COVID-19? Yes, um, the short answer is yes. Uh, but you know, when um, wh what we're publishing now, it won't be um, be be de uh, uh, aggregated. 
But what we're pu publishing now, the results we got up to mid um, mid March. So uh, frankly, I mean, you know, when you know the start of COVID nineteen, I guess the the the, the for most countries, uh, for me, I mean, it varies by country. Um, but the brunt of the answers, I suspect, were, came across pre COVID nineteen for the majority of the people who responded. But afterwards, when we have more results, we'll be able to do that in a, in a much more granular fashion. But I think what, um, what we'll put out now in the next few days will, be, will reflect largely, not exclusively, but to a significant extent, um, pre-COVID-19 responses. And then we'll see as the year goes on, we'll, I mean, I'm sure we'll see changes. Thank you. Uh, Cecilia Torres asks, how can we implement uh, effective education in areas of the world where children do not have access to Wi-Fi? Well, this, this is a massive problem. I mean, under my, you know, my, my other responsibility for the Secretary General is um, working on digital cooperation. And COVID has greatly accelerated a trend that already existed towards digitalization of everything, digitalization of our uh, communications with our friends, with our family, digitalization of our jobs, uh, digitalization of, of, of health. Um, that has been, uh, I, I, I was talking to some experts this morning and they said in the health sphere, digital medicine has advanced more in weeks than it happened in a decade. Um, and I don't think we're going to go back to where we were before. But that's great for those who have access um, to digital technologies. But I'm afraid the digital divide, the gravity of that divide is going to get much greater. The very fact that kids, as your question alludes to, um, who live in countries where there's good connectivity will be able to continue their, inter their education I don't want to say uninterrupted, but with, with, with minimum disruption. But that's not a luxury that kids in countries um, without that level of connectivity will have. Um, and they'll be much more dependent on parents trying to take over that role uh, or caregivers, but without um, uh, the access to school materials that uh, those of us living in countries like the US can benefit from. So I, I, I think the short answer is that I think there's a very big effort by UNICEF, by the World Bank and others to step up connectivity of schools, but that, that's not something that can be done from one day to the next. But I hope that this COVID crisis will make us pay afterwards much greater attention as a matter of um, you know, vital importance to addressing um, the digital divide with a view to stopping it, making inequalities that already exist much more profound. And education is just one example of that, but it goes much further. Thank you. And the final question is from Marielle Ali. Now with the consultations being held online due to COVID-19, how can we ensure consultation responses are truly inclusive, particularly for those on the other side of the digital divide? Yeah, I mean, frankly, it's got much more difficult, but we're, we're looking at how we can do that better. I mean, we want to use radio. We want to use, um, we're using in some countries where there's very little digital footprint, um, questionnaires, I mean, on paper that people fill in and then somebody who has access to a computer feeds it into a computer. Where, um, where we want to use, I mean, you know, connectivity um, to cell phones is much higher. I think it's almost 90% in the world. It's much higher than internet um, access. So we're also working with cell phone um, providers or, or cell, um, um, uh, mobile telephone networks to try and use um, uh, cell phones um, to get um, to get answers. But it, but obviously it's grown it's grown more difficult than it was um, pre pre COVID. And just to, to highlight that, 
you know, Pew, the Pew Research Foundation, that is, you know, the Rolls Royce or whatever, the, the ultimate in research companies, um, we're going to do um, uh, surveys, in-depth, independent surveys for us in 50 countries. Um, but all their surveys were anticipated to be done in person because, you know, under their methodology, they're purists. I mean, they don't even believe in phone surveys. Um, in most places, they believe, you know, for, for a pure um, survey methodology, you need a human being who goes and talks to other human beings. So we've had to radically um, um, cut back on their work because that's not feasible. So we, we, will, we are facing that problem um, and we're looking for solutions, but, but obviously it's grown more difficult. Well, thank you. And thank you so much, uh, Mr. Hoschild, for taking time out of your busy schedule uh, to have a dialogue on the need for global citizen participation in the UN 75 consultation process. Um, it's so important that we all find a way to get involved. And you know, hopefully your remarks today have inspired particip participants to join UNA USA's online consultations. Um, speaking of which, uh, attendees can register for UNA USA's seven, UN 75 consultations by visiting unausa.org forward slash UN 75 and UN 75 is lowercase. I also encourage um, everyone on this call, if you haven't already, to join the United Nations Association of the USA at unausa.org. With over 20,000 members and more than 200 chapters across the country, we are united in advancing the UN's mission and achieving the sustainable de development goals. And finally, just as a reminder, the Global Engagement Online Series is a year-long program so I hope you can join us for upcoming programs in the coming weeks. And please text GEOS to 738674 for more information. Uh, this has been a really great conversation that we've had today with Mr. Uh, Hoshtild. And I just hope that um, everyone finds a way to get involved, um, participate in the global consultations, um, do what you can to move this world forward so we can have a better world. Uh, thank you once again, everyone, for participating, and I hope you all stay safe and stay well. Thank you.